Very good. <clears throat> well, thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to speak to the group and certainly honored to be um, speaking alongside um, uh, the two other distinguished guests, Silvio and Mary, whose work I admire greatly. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to um, start by talking from the perspective of biomedical research uh, and biomedical applications of nanosims. Next slide. So my goal over the next 15 minutes or so is to provide my view of the power of nanosims, um, a methodology that we have called multi-isotope imaging mass spectrometry, or MIMS for short. This terminology certain ha certainly hasn't been taken up by the wider community, but um, I still find it useful to use this terminology, and it's also a way to sort of pay homage to one of my mentors, Claude Lachene, who is a giant, uh, is a giant in this field. Um, so I'm going to share my perspective as a biomedical researcher, and to do so, I will illustrate the application of nanosims um, with two translational examples, um, metabolic reprogramming and pulmonary arterial hypertension, a really horrible, um, highly morbid disease, and tumor metabolic heterogeneity. Next slide, please. So for those of you who aren't <laughs> familiar with this technology but are in the biology and biomedical research sphere, um, one way I, I sort of um, view uh, view this technology um, in uh, using an analogy that many of you will be familiar with, if not all of you will be familiar with, is that MIMS or nanosims brings molecular imaging from tissue level resolution down to the suborganelle level. And I use as point of comparison um, FDG PET imaging which is very familiar to those of you in the, in many of you in the research and certainly in the medical fields as being a critical part, both of our research and clinical um, enterprise. So on the left, I show an example from a paper a number of years ago by Farouk Jafar in which he showed FDG glucose avidity um, in an atherosclerotic lesion in humans in the carotid artery and, and, and the red dots indicate a highly glucose avid lesion in the carotid artery. On the right, I show an example of what we achieve with, with nanosims. And this is not um, human, uh, this is a murine model of atherosclerosis, where we've tracked um, glucose into individual cells in these atherosclerotic lesions. And you can see um, on the far right that there's a signal as indicated by the rainbow colors in multiple cellular layers within this um, lesion. And over the course of the next few minutes, I hope to give you an idea both how these images are acquired and what they mean and how they can be useful. Next slide. So when we talk about MIMS rather than just nanosims, um, we're generally um, talking about the merger of in vivo stable isotope tracers with the nanosims um, uh, microscope. And so, <clears throat> Uh, as many of you know, um, there's an extensive um, history of using non-radioactive stable isotopic tracers, going back to the work of Schoenheimer and others in the early part of the last century, where they um, used stable isotope tracers in bulk mass spectrometry um, applications to demonstrate the dynamic nature of many of the canonical pathways of intermediate metabolism. And one of the advantages of stable isotopic tracers is that um, the uh, parent molecule is unchanged, unlike FDG PET tracers, where the, the, um, the molecular structure is different than native glucose. In these types of experiments, the parent molecule is unchanged. We just play with the enrichment of this rare stable isotopic variants of a given element. So to use nitrogen as an example, most nitrogen we know has a mass of 14 from the periodic table, but about 0.37% of all nitrogen is nitrogen 15. And so if we give tracers that instead of being enriched in nitrogen 14 are enriched in nitrogen 15, we can track those with mass spectrometry in various forms of isotope ratio mass spectrometry. So what nanosims really provides in the context of a stable isotope tracer experiment is the possibility of performing isotope ratio measurements and thereby tracking these stable isotope tracers in domains down to at best under 50 nanometers by 50 nanometers. So in this right 
hand image, I show you an example of a, a fibroblast that was grown in the presence of 15N, the rare isotopic variant of nitrogen, 15N tagged thymidine. Of course, thymidine is a nucleotide building block of DNA. It gets incorporated into the genome with cell division and DNA synthesis. And here what you see is that the nucleus, um, the, the round structure, is intensely labeled with 15N thymidine. And I've blown up a region of the nuclear cytosolic interface to demonstrate what these images really show. And essentially, each pixel on one of these images is an individual isotope ratio measurement. And for the purposes of today's talk, and when you see these images, the bottom end of the scale, the blue end of the scale, is set to natural abundance, which would mean no enrichment or localization of tracer. And then the rainbow colors indicate different degrees of enrichment. Next slide, please. So just to summarize, from my perspective, um, the power of MIMS is attributable to, amongst other characteristics, its high spatial resolution, at best below 50 nanometers lateral. The fact that it's quantitative, the fact that one can use multiplex tracers within the same experiment and within the same uh, analysis. And again, building on the long history of using stable isotope tracers which are innocuous and non-radioactive, it's entirely human compatible. Next slide. So the first vignette I'd like to share, as I alluded to on the first slide, is metabolic reprogramming in a disease called pulmonary arterial hypertension. Now, this is a highly morbid, if not um, lethal disease in almost everyone who gets this disease. Luckily, it's quite rare. Um, borrowing from the cancer literature, there was this concept that part of the pathophysiology of this disease is that there's metabolic reprogramming of key cellular constituents of the blood vessels that are found in the lungs, which is where this disease pathophysiology transpires. But <clears throat> when you look at this data, the concept of metabolic reprogramming in these critical disease-causing cells um, is largely based on in vitro data. And so our goal with this project was, was twofold. The first was to use nanosims to assess for metabolic reprogramming in the lung vessels where the disease pathology transpires. And secondly, we wanted to use nanosims as a functional test of a network medicine prediction regarding metabolic, specific metabolic pathway involvement in the pathophysiology of this disease. And I'll get to that concept in, in the next slide, please. So network medicine is, is a relatively new field that seeks to try to make sense of large omics data sets and um, look globally at these data sets rather than necessarily just at specific pathways. And it posits that when there are important nodes that are implicated in disease, there's multiple interactions between these nodes in different pathways. And then there's also interactions between um, potential disease-causing nodes and the larger um, uh, transcriptional or other types of networks that have been linked to the disease. And so to, as, a, as an example of how this network medicine analyses um, transpired, um, we used a, a rat pulmonary arterial hypertension model, which is driven by um, a single injection of a toxic chemical that drives inflammatory changes specifically in the blood vessels found in the lung. And over the course of several weeks, this disease process um, uh, transpires. And once the disease was established, we isolated endothelial cells, the cells lining the blood vessels from these animals, and used these freshly isolated cells to do RNA sequencing and define the transcriptional changes that take place in the endothelial cells in the context of this disease. And what we found is we found that um, the transcripts that were upregulated in these endothelial cells um, showed a marked degree of overlap with um, a gene, pro gene programs that have been linked to the human disease, number one. And then when we looked um, in an unbiased fashion at a various uh, metabolic pathways, that were close to or overlapped with these disease modules, 
Um, this implicated both glucose metabolism, which was not surprising based on the literature that was in the field. And it also in, in indicated um, the metabolism of the amino acid proline. And so this led to the hypothesis that both of these um, metabolic pathways were important for the disease. And moreover, it led to the hypothesis that there was some convergence of these two pathways because these two pathways were quite close in the network space. And so we sought to use nanosims or MIMS to test um, whether or not we could see evidence of increased glucose and proline metabolism in the endothelial cells in this model, and two, whether they would demonstrate convergence or association. Next slide, please. And so <clears throat> in order to, as a preliminary test of this hypothesis, this is the experiment that we did. Um, we, uh, uh, initiated the disease model, as I alluded to in the prior slide, and uh, nearly one month after injection of MCT, which is the toxic compound that initiates the disease model, we gave two doses of deuterated glucose and 15N proline um, to mice in the 24 hours prior to sacrifice. On the top row, you see um, the appearance of a vehicle injected uh, artery, which is normal in, pure, in appearance. So these are control pulmonary arteries that demonstrate a thin wall. You see the red blood cells and the lumen of these structures. And what you see is that there's very little in the way of glucose or proline labeling in the cells that comprise the wall of these ar arteries. On the bottom, what you see is the disease model um, vessels. And I hope, hope you can appreciate that the thickness of the wall of the vessels is greatly increased. And this is the classical ves vascular remodeling that characterizes this disease. I hope what you can also appreciate if you look at the far right is that there's an increased punctate labeling of glucose and at the far, far right, uh, increased labeling of the proline signal um, really th um, throughout many of the layers of the wall of the artery. So visually, we see, we get the sense that there's increased avidity for both of these substrates, glucose and proline. Next slide. <clears throat> um, I, I, in the opening, I emphasize that this is really a quantitative and uh, methodology that also uh, enables um, localization in very small domains. So this is an example of what I'm talking about here, what we did is, um, which is very common in the field to do line profiles, um, where uh, if you look at the graph on the right, on the y-axis, we have distance from the top of the little box shown on the left. Um, and then on the y-axis, we have the degree of stable isotope ratio. Um, and enrichment would be anything above the dotted line, which is the natural ratio. And so what you see here as you go from the lumen of the artery at the left of the graph, where there's um, low or low, if not zero labeling, if you go towards the right, as you get into the vessel wall, you see a, a, a spike in the degree of labeling. And there's late, even though there's labeling throughout the vessel wall, um, there seems to be a predominance of labeling in the first layer, which is the endothelial layer. And this is the cell type that we were most interested in and the cell type that was the basis for the transcriptional um, uh, analyses that I showed in the, uh, a couple of slides ago. Next slide. <clears throat> Underscoring the ability to quantify this signal, um, this is uh, a summary of the uh, endothelial labeling across three um, diseased rats and three control rats. And so each dot plot on these labels is a different endothelial cell and the degree of, of proline labeling on the left and glucose labeling on the right. And what we see is that there's an augmentation in, in proline labeling in the endothelium. Uh, uh, it was less dramatic with the glucose labeling on the right, but um, it certainly trended in that direction. And when we included all of the cells that we analyzed as emerged analysis, it became statistically significant. So um, this, these data are consistent with our hypothesis that there would be reprogramming of proline and glucose metabolism in the endothelium of MCT vessels. <clears throat> 
And just as point of comparison, uh, a PET scan, for example, which is being used in this disease, both in animals and in humans, would give you sort of tissue scale resolution, but it could not localize this type of signal either to the blood vessels and certainly not localize it to the endothelial cells, a, a, a single cellular subset of the blood vessels. Next slide. And so I said part of the prediction of the network medicine was that there would be a convergence or an association between the endothelial, uh, between the glucose labeling and the, um, and the proline labeling. And so here what we see when we look at these um, uh, labels side by side in a, in a higher resolution image in the wall of the vessel, again, what you see if you look at the bottom right image that the first layer next to the lumen, the lumen is at the left, and then we're traveling into the blood vessel as we go from left to right. You see that that first layer uh, of cells has a high degree of both glucose and proline labeling. What you can see is that there's also numerous punctate cell, subcellular or extracellular hotspots of labeling. When we look at this, we see that these hotspots often correlate with each other, meaning the hotspots in proline are also hotspots in glucose. However, they don't always correlate. So there are um, also punctate areas, for example, where you see a hotspot of proline labeling, but no uh, or very little glucose labeling. So what this suggests is that there's, um, in some regions of the vessel wall, at least, convergence of, of, of proline and glucose uh, metabolic labeling. And this is shown on the right at the cellular level, where we see that in the vehicle animals, there's not a correlation between these two labels. But um, when we look at the endothelial cells, there is a correlation between um, the glucose labeling on the x-axis and the proline labeling on the y-axis, consistent with the network medicine prediction. Next slide. So the next vignette I'm going to finish with is uh, tumor metabolism. And the goal here was to define intratumor heterogeneity of metabolic function at the single cell level in mice and humans. And I'm going to show you our first human data that's really fresh off the presses within the past month. And I'm going to share uh, uh, our initial um, in analysis of the functional significance of tumor, tumor metabolic heterogeneity. We have a lot of work to do on this question, but um, we're getting some sense early on. Next slide. So <clears throat> when we first did this, these experiments, there was evidence from the PET literature that different regions of tumors might e exhibit different degrees of glucose avidity, for example, but we had no real idea how much um, heterogeneity we would see on a cell-to-cell -cell basis. And this is uh, a genetically engineered mouse um, tumor model. Um, <clears throat> these are P53 NF1 mutant mice that spontaneously develop most commonly malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors shown on the top, but um, they will also occasionally get histiosarcomas and other types of tumors shown on the bottom row at the, um, at, at, with the histiosarcoma. And if you look at this histiosarcoma, which is shown um, quantitatively on the right, what you see is that there's a marked degree across several orders of magnitude of both the um, glucose and the glutamine label here, which are the two key labels we looked at. We also independently gave BRDU, which is a nucleotide label that um, labels um, proliferating cells. And what we found is that there was a marked degree of heterogeneity of metabolic activity independent of the degree of, um, of whether the cells were proliferating or not. And here uh, in the inset shown at the top right, you see an example of really adjacent cells that reveal, reveal marked differences in labeling. At the middle, you have a cell that has, um, uh, is negative for BRDU, meaning it did not um, divide during the labeling period. It's markedly avid for glucose, and on the far right, it's not very avid for glutamine. Um, in contrast, it's surrounded by two cells that divided that were avid for glutamine, but really not very avid for glucose. So our question really was whether or not these types of subpopulations of metabolically distinct cells could account for treatment resistance in the same way that genetic outliers may account for treatment resistance. So you could imagine a situation where uh, a, a chemotherapy or a targeted molecular treatment would kill most of the cells, but these cells would be resistant, these outlier cells. Next slide. <clears throat> 
And so to, as a preliminary test of this, um, we uh, repeated the experiment in a different genetically engineered mouse model. And this was appealing because there was a recent demonstration of a, a combination molecular therapy that was highly effective um, at treating uh, these tumors, although um, with time, often um, a resistance would emerge. And this was a combination of JQ1, a bromodomain inhibitor, and PD901, um, uh, and that had been shown in a paper by our collaborators in 2014 to be quite effective in this model. And so our idea, as shown schematically at the top, which I alluded to on the prior slide, is that we would kill most of the cells and these metabolic outliers would recover and then repopulate the tumor. Interestingly, what we found is that um, uh, the most, so our prediction was that we would compress heterogeneity, that we would select for homogeneity. And what we found was that um, even though there was in general with treatment, a downward shift in the degree of heterogeneity in, in, in the treated tumors, the most resistant and most proliferative tumors through treatment were the most heterogeneous. Next slide. And so with this result, we refined our working hypothesis, which is an active area of study. And, and that is that metabolic heterogeneity is an indicator of metabolic flexibility and promotes growth and treatment resistance. So if we looked at all our, our tumors on an XY graph, what we found is that the proliferative index um, as a function of the percent BRDU positive cells predicted heterogeneity of both glucose and glutamine um, metabolism consistent with this hypothesis. Next slide. So I want to end with a teaser here. Um, as I said, this is um, just off the presses. So we've been interested in translating this approach to human tumors to, to assess whether or not there's similar degrees of heterogeneity in human tumors. And so the experiment here, and this is our first um, nice images that um, were just were just um, completed. Um, the experiment here is that we take patients who have been diagnosed with high-grade glioblastomas. Um, this is a brain tumor that's highly morbid and, and lethal almost uniformly within a year or two. And we administer deuterated glucose and 15N glutamine the night before they go to surgery as a single oral cocktail. And then we get a piece of the tumor um, when the tumor is taken out in the operating room. And so this, just uh, as a teaser proof of concept, I show a single field from a human GBM tumor. And if you look at the phosphorus image here, this is a proxy for, similar to DAPI that shows the nuclei. Uh, you see really irregular shaped nuclei, different sizes consistent with what we see with cancer. Um, and if you look at the far right, what you see is that um, we're starting to see, appreciate a similar degree of heterogeneity in both the glutamine and glucose tracer uptake, um, similar to what we'd seen in some of the murine tumors. So we have a small pilot going now, and we've recruited um, several patients with this disease. Um, and hopefully within the next year or two, we'll have um, more interesting information about this. So last, sl next slide. So in summary, metabolic reprogramming and pulmonary hypertension de demonstrates the power of using nanosims functional measurements to test predictions from orthogonal omics anal analyses. And I hope you appreciate that our tumor studies demonstrate heterogeneity in small cellular subpopulations of metabolic outliers analogous to what has been discovered with single cell genomics methods. Next slide. To give you a sense of the overview of the types of studies we've done, we have, uh, we've done a lot of work on looking at DNA synthesis and cell turnover, um, substrate utilization, which is most of the work I've shown today. We've done some work on single or organelles instead of looking at single cells, getting down to single or organelles. And I suspect our next two speakers will dig into some of this high resolution imaging even more. And then we've had a number of human translational efforts. And I think from, from my perspective, as a physician researcher, that's the area that I'm most excited by. Last slide. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone who worked on this. Um, and in particular, I'd like to give a shout out to Christelle Guillemier, who's been a longtime collaborator and friend. Um, I couldn't have done this work without her. She has taken over the Brigham and Women's Hospital Harvard Center for Nanoimaging, where all this work is done. And um, so I thank you for your attention.
Yes, thank you, Matt. Excellent and exciting talk. So I made a comment earlier that we can post the uh, uh, questions in the chat, but apparently this is not true. The chat is disabled, but we have to post them apparently in some kind of Q&A section in the in the teams, which I have never heard of. So perhaps uh, those of you who have experience with teams more, please use that option. It's called Q&A. <laughs> Now, I have a very quick question, Matt. So, how, what is the general approach to prepare your samples? So, um, the general approach, uh, most of our samples, especially if you're talking about um, tissue samples, which is what I showed here, is to fix the samples with um, generally aldehyde fixatives like paraformaldehyde. Um, we embed in resin similar to electron microscopy um, do sections that are thicker than electron microscopy, about 500 nanometers, but thinner than your standard paraffin or frozen sections, of course. And, um, and then often uh, we gold coat, but not always. Um, there are a few branch points that we consider when we're thinking about sample prep. So if we want to potentially do immunostaining or certain other uh, analyses of adjacent sections, um, we'll use paraformaldehyde rather than glutaraldehyde and some of the other fixatives used for electron microscopy. And similarly, if we want to potentially do immunostaining, we'll use LR white, which is a more porous, um, less hydrophobic resin, as opposed to EPON, which is probably the most commonly used electron microscopy resin. So generally, they're embedded. Um, we also occasionally do whole mount cellular samples. I did not show any of that data, but um, but um, so it really, we, we customize the sample prep to the question and the types of orthogonal or correlative imaging that we might want to do. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. And what is the, the deposition is on the silicon wafers or what? Yeah, so we mount uh, them on, on silicon wafers. Yeah, okay. um, we, we often gold coat because it deals with some of the charging issues and, 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 and really improves throughput for us. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, a lot of the biology experiments we do, um, throughput is a huge issue, right? Because we want to get a lot of cells, a lot of vessels, uh, analyze multiple humans or multiple um, animals. And so it's a little different set of trade-offs than, for example, a lot of the inorganic sciences where, you know, you might focus on a really small area for a long period of time. So um, these are the trade-offs we wrestle with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, great. Thank you very much. Yes, I think we can go to the next speaker so that we are well in time. So Mary, would you be able now to start your talk?